Let's say we wanted to find the line of best fit for these three points. Although eyeballing it is easy, it's not the most exact. So let's use calculus to find it. First, we need a metric to see how well our line fits. We can look at how different our line's approximation, f of x, is from the actual y value at every point. We can assign an error to each point, which is equal to the square of the difference between the actual value and our line's value. We square the difference to get rid of our negative values, and to more harshly judge our line the farther away it is from points. The sum of all those squared errors represents how well the line fits over all points. We can do some further expanding when we realize that f of x is a line, and can be written as mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. When we substitute this in and rearrange, we get a function that represents the total error of our function in terms of the slope and y-intercept. Here is where the calculus comes in. Since we want to find the line that has the minimum error for our data, we want, the, we want to minimize the error function. The first step in minimizing this function is to take its derivative. This may get a little confusing for non-multivariable calculus students, but I'll try to explain it in simple terms. Since there are two variables in our equation, m and b, we need to take two partial derivatives. The partial derivative with respect to m, and the partial derivative with respect to b. The way that partial derivatives work is that the variables that are not being differentiated to are treated as constants. In other words, partial derivatives tell us how does the function change when changing this variable and not any others. Also, partial derivatives are usually written with the symbol del instead of d with normal derivatives. In the case of our error function, let's take the partial derivative with respect to m first by using the power rule and the chain rule. Now let's take the partial derivative with respect to b, which, use, which again uses the power rule and the chain rule. Now that we have our two partial derivatives, we can set each one equal to zero, like you would for a normal derivative, and solve for each variable using various substitution methods for a system of equations. Now that we have done this, we know that the error function has a minimum where the slope is equal to 4.781 and the y-intercept is equal to 3.68. When we graph our line of best fit, it turns out that it fits the data perfectly. In fact, this method that we have just done by fitting our function to the data will work for any set of data. Let's take this set of data points for example, and let's say we want to fit a 6th degree polynomial to it. Notice that in our linear example, we only had two parameters that we could, we could adjust, the slope and the y-intercept, but with this 6th degree polynomial, we have seven parameters we can adjust. Also, we have way more points in this example, 10 versus 3 from the last one. If you thought our error function looked bad, this is what it looks like now. The partial derivatives are equally complex and numerous. How do we solve this then? Moreover, even if you could solve this, it would be very difficult for a computer, let alone you, to solve this analytically. What if instead of solving for when the derivatives are equal to zero, we lightly nudge the parameters a tiny bit in the right direction to find a local minimum? To help visualize this process, let's take a look at the first linear example. Here we have two partial derivatives that represent the derivative of the error function. When taken together, they represent the gradient of the function, which is a vector of a function's partial derivatives, commonly represented by the symbol nabla. Gradients can be thought of as a multi-dimensional multi derivative, as they can have multi-partial derivative components. It turns out that this gradient vector points us in the direction of steepest ascent of the function, basically the direction that the function is increasing the most. To convince you of this, let's imagine the graph, such as y equals x squared, which has the derivative of 2x. If we represent the derivative as a vector, which points to the right when the derivative is positive, and points to the left when the derivative is negative, we can see that the derivative always points in the direction of steepest ascent. At x equals 2, the derivative is 4, and the vector points in the right direction because the function grows larger when going to the right. At x equals 0, the derivative is 0, and the vector has 0 magnitude, which can be thought of as both directions having equal steepness. At x equals negative 2, the derivative is negative 4, and the vector points to the left because the function grows larger when growing to the left. As the derivative gets larger, the vector's magnitude increases, showing that at more extreme values, the larger the change in the function when going to the direction of the vector. When looking at our function, a 3D function where there is a slope axis, a y-intercept axis, and a function axis, we can see that the gradient vector tells us the direction we should travel along to most quickly increase the value of the function. Why are we looking at this phenomenon, you may ask? Well, think about this. If we know the direction of steepest ascent, 
we know the direction of steepest descent, which is just the opposite direction. When taking the negative gradient or slope, we can find the vector which points us in the direction of the steepest descent, the direction we want to nudge our slope and y-intercept parameters to minimize our function error. We start the process by picking an initial condition for both the slope and y-intercept of our function. We then evaluate the gradient of the error function by evaluating both partial derivatives with our parameters. This gives us a 2D vector which points in the direction of steepest descent, which we then negate to give us the direction of steepest descent. Next, we add this 2D vector to a vector of our slope and y-intercept, making sure to match up the correct partial derivatives with its respective parameter. What this does is it moves our position in the direction of the negative gradient leveraging the fact that vector addition means a translation in some direction. Lastly, we change our slope and y-intercept values to these new nudged values and repeat the process over and over until our gradient vector is below some threshold of magnitude, which means that the function is not decreasing anymore and has reached a local minimum. After several iterations, we reach approximately the same answer as the one we calculated analytically. You can almost think of this as a ball rolling down a hill. It will roll down until it reaches a local minimum, where it stops rolling. Even if a smaller global minimum exists, the ball will not roll there because it is stuck in this local minimum. To fit this analogy, this process is aptly named gradient descent, as we are descending down the function using its gradient, in hope of finding local minimums. Sometimes this doesn't work out though. Looking back at our 2D function example of x squared, where an x equals 2, the negative derivative points in the left direction, correctly towards the local minimum. The magnitude of this step is 4 though, which would mean if we stepped a size of 4 to the left, we would end up at x equals negative 2, which would put us in an infinite loop of going back and forth between 2 and negative 2 with step sizes of 4. We need something to fix this oscillation or overshooting behavior because we want to reach the local minimum. We can fix this by multiplying our negative derivative by a small number, such as 0.1 or 0.01. Doing this, we take smaller steps so that we converge on a local minimum without overshooting, even if we take more steps to do so. When transitioning over to 3D, this works the same way. We multiply a small constant to our negative gradient before adding it to our slope and y-intercept so that we converge better. Great! Now we have a universal method of approximating any function given any data points. Spoiler alert, that is what a neural network is, a universal function approximator, that's it. Given some inputs and outputs, we can fit a function to the data by minimizing its error on the data. Although I won't get into the deeper, more technical details about neural networks in this video, I'll give you a quick overview about how they work. Neural networks are called networks because they are a network of neurons, which are basically just linear functions, each with a slope and y-intercept, linked up and composed together to form a gigantic mega-function. To clarify, these neurons are called neurons because they loosely mimic the way that biological neurons work. They fire or give specific outputs when shown specific inputs. With typical neural networks having thousands or even millions of parameters, they can learn virtually anything you give them. For example, Recent innovations at the artificial intelligence research company OpenAI have made it possible for a neural network to map natural language to images. For example, this is an image of a nebula shaped as a seahorse, a topiary hedge cut in the shape of Homer Simpson, an image of a cybertronic panda, and a drawing of a forest made of candy canes. All of these images look like they were either photographed or drawn by a human, but that is not the case. All of these images never existed before and were created by a neural network that found a good function that could map English text to images. What this shows is an incredible ability for neural networks to generalize their knowledge. Like how when drawing your line of best fit on a graph, you gain new information for the points where no y value was originally present in the given dataset. In this sense, neural networks are simply universal function approximators that learn through the iterative process of gradient descent, all made possible through calculus.